Hey there! Okay, so I want to talk about how I transcribed Brendan Burns' 27-note uh, etude because, like, transcription is pretty routine for me. By the way, we are using crappy, crappy camera audio, so, you know, if that's going to get you away, then too late. Um, but anyway, I've got a lot of materials here, and I kind of had a process for going through it that I thought might be a little bit interesting because it actually ended up being pretty, like, multi-step just because of all of the microtonality involved and all of the different tools that I can use to get at it. So, as you can see, I've got my computer screen up, so um, we can also take a look at how this was done. So, first thing I did is I just took the video and I put it in a Reaper session right here. So, um, this Reaper section, this Reaper session basically has, um, it has the entire thing and I can pull up the, the video window here and, and look at what Brendan is playing. Um, and it is very cool. Because um, Reaper does have video. It exports funny and it's weird. But um, it is actually a useful tool for lining things up. So now I've got everything here. Okay, so I'm just playing everything on the computer, right? I've got this here. So now what I'm using to figure out the chords is, well, of course, in the etude, this isn't... You know, some of the chords here are a little bit, a little bit uh, funky and interesting, but a lot of them come from like quasi-diatonic constructs. So that's what my ear is picking up right away, and I'm using my ear and sliding the MIDI around. That I have, I have like a mock-up MIDI version of it. So check out this little track right here. This is a 27-tone synthesizer, and I was just dragging things around until I had the right chords. So if I play it along, it should sound basically the same. Hear how that's like a silly keyboard sound instead? If I have just Brendan, it sounds like this. And if I have just the synth sound, it sounds like this. <laughs> okay. Cool. So... That um, was sort of, sort of how I did that part, is I was lining up the MIDI, and there were also times when, like, check out this first part. There's all these, like, little sweet arpeggiations in it, right? Like, in this first part. So, if I wasn't sure about a chord, um, one thing I could do is I could go like this. Well, let's do it without the synthesizer. Do. Do, do. Do, do. Sixth, right? Is it a sixth? Do, do, do. Oh, that's right, because it's a B half flat um, nine chord in first inversion. Yeah, so I, if I just stop and pause really quick, if there are some notes on arpeggiations that I don't know, I can be like, oh, okay, so that's the exact arpeggiation of a chord. If I just knew that like it was major, but I didn't know like where the thirds and fifths went and stuff like that. And there's really only a few options because of the guitar. So this is where things get even more interesting. Because uh, since there's so many angles to attack this at, um, it kind of becomes like a logic puzzle. Because like, okay, I figured this out with MIDI, right? Like I went through the whole thing and I just like, you know, wrote down like the MIDI chords. Do, 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 do. And he has all these cool bends on some of the notes, which uh, makes some of them hard to figure out. So there were a few times where I was off by one, and it was either because of bending or because of the sound effect. But I was never off by one when this quality of the chord was, like, very, very significantly affected by something being, like, a different third or fifth size. Um, it has to do with more, like, these passing notes here. Like, for example, in this section... Da, da. When he goes down to da, da, it's slightly sharper than da, da. Da, 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 da. So he actually uses like a fourth that's up by a 27th of an octave because of like how the fretting works and how the stacks work in his hand. Because if you hear that part, right, it stacks the fourths. So then you transfer that logic to the guitar and see what he's doing with that. So yeah, this was kind of step one. Step one was just literally going through and midiing everything. Um, so that I had all of the MIDI so that I knew what the chords were in those instances. Um, and I also knew his string tuning from a Facebook comment. So the string tuning actually isn't all super Pythagorean. He breaks the chain. Uh, the string tuning is like E, 
A, so that's a perfect fourth. And then A goes up to, I think, D up, instead of just normal D, since the fourths are so flat. D up, G up, then B, I believe, and then E. So this allows him, um, on pairs of strings that are next to each other, to get fourths in the positioning, uh, which is very, very helpful for figuring this stuff out. And obviously helpful for when he does, like, really crazy bar chords. There's some there at the end that are just, like, mind-blowing. Like, this E7 chord that's just, like, ugh, it looks like one of those, like, pictures on the internet where people are like sticking their fingers through the guitar to get the chords. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, I think it's like over here. Nah, it's over here somewhere. Oh, there it is! This one! Look at this one! Oh my god! Oh my god. That's, yeah. Now that's a chord right there. Okay, so, um, alright. We midied the whole thing. Uh, then the next step was actually converting it into notation and tab, which I wanted to do on a piece of paper just because it's so intuitive for me to write things down. So what I have here, then, is I have a handwritten version of what I deem things to be. So the rhythm is not written in at all because... Like, the etude kind of, like, proceeds in a certain pattern where I can just write, like, the big held note and then the melodic portion. So I write with that logic for a lot of the way through the whole thing. And so there's three pages to this, and I'm also, like, very efficient about writing things again, and I don't want to, like, repeat anything. And so then there's only one chord on the on the last page here. His very cool ending chord with... um. Uh, I don't know if you'd call it a minor sixth. I guess you'd call it a minor sixth in Pythagorean, like on the outside, where it's technically like a fifth with an up arrow. I spelled it as a fifth with an up arrow because he's got a, a sixth in it, and so I'm trying to spell things heptatonically. So this is also um, another way that I do notation, um, because like generally if you're reading the staff that has seven notes um, and seven lines and everything, you want to have heptatonic spelling when you can, like in chords with like seven notes and things like that. So here I'm always trying to obey those rules, even if the scales are nothing like major and minor. So that's why at the end I notate that last chord with a B, B up instead of uh, just a C, um, as it could also be. Um, so yeah, this was the notation that I wrote out. And then what happened was I kind of wrote out the notation and the tab at the same time, because I sort of knew what the chords were, and as I was going through, the fact that I was now adding tab to this allowed me to correct any small mistakes I had made, because the logic of the tab and how it's played, like, if you see it in the video, is very rigorous and uh, helps correct things. Like, if I had, like, one extra note in a chord or a voicing was wrong, I could just see that, like, oh, there's, like, no way he could have played that note. So I used all of that logic to fill this stuff in right here. So then that gets you the notation and, and the tab, uh, but not the rhythm. So now let's talk about how to notate 27 tone equal temperament itself. This is something I had to know before I undertook the project. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this lovely reaper session with Brendan playing his guitar. And now we're going to dive into D -D Dorico. Yes. Please sponsor this video, Dorico. We love you. Okay, um, so Dorico is the only software um, that I know of, music notation software, where it's just as easy to notate microtonal music as it is in 12 tone equal temperament, and all of the materials are right there. So you just have to download Dorico, and you've got it. Um, assuming I think you have the pro version? I don't know how the versions work. I have the version that's, like, not the basic version, but also not, like, the ultra elite version, I guess. Is there a middle? I don't know. Um, but yeah, so anyway, here is my Dorico file. And this is another opportunity for me to explain how I do microtonal tab in Dorico. So this is kind of a uh, transcription process video slash figuring out how microtonal tab in Dorico works video. So first let me show you the notation that I came up with, um, which is not mine. It just uh, it comes from the basic logic of having an equal temperament and using its circle of fifths to come up with a notation for its diatonic scale. And this works better in some tunings than in others. It works better in tunings that have diatonic scales with five whole steps and two half steps, where the logic is almost the same, and you just have to make a swell, small tweak. So, like, the farther 
the written values are from what you're used to in 12, the less it works. So, like, 22 EDO and 15 EDO, or 15 tone equal temperament and 22 tone equal temperament. Those are two great examples of borderline cases where you can sometimes use the native fifth notation, the one we just discussed, or a subset notation, which uses more accidentals but would be closer to what you would get in 12 tone equal temperament. Um, so, uh, with 27 tone equal temperament, if we come over here, um, basically... 27 tone equal temperament can be represented with a diatonic scale, and here it is right here in this area. Um, the whole step is uh, 5 27 of an octave, and the half step is 1 27 of an octave, um, which leads to a very exaggerated uh, super Pythagorean scale where the half step is very small. So, you know, if 12 tone equal temperament has, like, 2, you know, 2 and 1, then, well, let me see if I can try and give you, like, a little oral teaser. I don't have anything 27-y around me, but, um, like, if you were to sing a 12-tone major scale, it'd probably be something like, do, 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 and if you tried it in 27, it might be something like this, do, 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 just, like, the half step is really little. In fact, I think it's even technically a little bit smaller than a quarter tone. So, that means that, Usually, when Brendan is playing quasi-diatonic constructs, there are arrows in it that are, like, almost a diatonic construct, but just a little bit different. So, actually, the logic is really similar to 22 EDO. Like, if you have, if you have a chord that is supposed to be, like, a normal diatonic chord uh, with, you know, some serious notes in it, but the intervals don't actually add up the same way they do in the diatonic scale... Those kinds of chords in 22 and 27 look the same. They have like um, a fifth or maybe a few fifths in it, and then a few notes that point a certain way to indicate a lower major third. Now, another thing that's weird in 27 is that it's, um, it's a major third is the same approximation as in 12 tet, but it's notated with a down arrow, uh, something that was helpfully pointed out on Facebook by Yuhani. Um, so, anyway, here are the accidentals we have. Uh, we have a natural accidental, of course, and then as we proceed upwards, basically you can think of um, the chromatic semitone being 4 and the diatonic semitone being 1. And the diatonic semitone is already there in our half step, so that makes sense. So going up 1 gives you just a note that's up altered 1. You could also think of 1 27 of an octave as being a half sharp pointed down, but I almost never see those, um, so they're kind of rare. I don't know if you would ever need them for spelling. You might. Um, I haven't really examined those situations, but then a half sharp gives you 2 27ths of an octave, a sharp down is 3 27ths, right, because that's just like chromatic semitone down one, and then 5 is a sharp up, you know, not to a double sharp yet, because we've got to keep doing these intermediary accidentals. So basically the pattern is, if you're starting on a note, um, if you go up two twenty-sevenths of an octave, you get the half accidental, and then if you go two more, you get the next one, like the sharp, and then two more, you get that next quarter accidental, and then there's intermediary arrows in between, so that's the pattern. Um, and you can see all of that right here, so that means a double sharp ends up being seven twenty-sevenths of an octave. And if we go down the other way, we see a similar thing, pointing down gets one, point, uh, half flat gets two, uh, flat up gets three, normal flat gets four, uh, flat down gets five, sesqui flat. I uh, get six, and double flight gets seven. Um, wait, is that right? Yes, it is. No. Hold on. Oh, actually, I don't think that is right. Yeah, that might not be right, but I never had to use the doubles, um, so who cares? Okay, well, at least all the other notation is right, because that is all the normally used stuff. So that means that whenever I, um, whenever I put a note in like this, um, it gives me the option of the accidental to choose, and then I can just edit it normally. So let's talk about the tab here. So this tab, actually, I might want to go to a different page that's not the intro page, because I kind of figured out this little uh, Dorico microtonal tab life hack as I went along. It wasn't something that I knew when I first started working on the project. So there is one video about this. Um, and it's right here. It's called Faking Tab in Dorico by Sebastian Gustafsson. Oh, only three subscribers. Come on, people. Okay, um, so here's um, his video about it. He explains that what you can do is if you want to create a staff line that is also like an independent functioning tab, you can create a percussion instrument and then 
name your uh, percussion instrument's staves different strings. Um, so you can just watch that video if you want to figure out how to do that. But as you can see here, he's doing this with a bass tab. Uh, so this is kind of the way to do microtonal tab. Although, honestly, I haven't tried just like taking a microtonal staff and sticking it into tab. I don't know what's going to happen if I do that. Um, maybe it will result in like uh, decimal values. Maybe it will just be junk and garbage. Maybe it'll actually like spit out the EDO, like reasonable EDO values. That would be really, really fascinating. Um, I don't even know if anyone's actually ever tried it. Um, but it's not something I'm going to do on camera right now. Looks like the internet's not going to work, so we're not going to get to watch this part of the video. So let me, let's see. Oh, okay, here we go. So um, there are two sort of ways that Sebastian here explains how to write your own tab down in Dorico. Um, he has a script that will automatically take text boxes and put them on the string staves, uh, kind of his notes, um, which I didn't feel accomplished enough to try and download. Um, and then the other way is to take stemmed notes and make them all invisible and then overlay the text on them with shift, shift X. So like if I was in Dorico here, say, and I wanted to have like some note here, uh, like, oh look, here's a random quarter note. I could hide it. Um, I, I, I could hide it by changing the color completely. And then when I go out of here, hey, look at that, it's hidden. But look, there's also this tide note that's not hidden. And there are tide notes all of the time. In fact, I was trying to get around this in another composition I posted to YouTube, um, Three Weeping Tyrants. That uses 10-tone equal temperament, so I wanted the tab for the 10-tone guitar to be on the screen in notation as well. So this was not only a really annoying problem, but I found that like having to drag the text to like every point that every note was on, I, I would do it string by string, but it was just taking too long. So here's actually the better method, which I found out. So let's see if I undo everything. Will this text box go back to where it's supposed to be, please? Yes, okay, good. It did go back to where it was supposed to be. Now the catch is that the format is gonna be very weird. So you are gonna have to do this uh, after everything else is written in. Um, but what you wanna do is you want to use a monosyllabic font and then treat Eh, eh. treat each measure, each bar, as one text box instead of doing an individual text box for each note. Now, I already use Andale Mano for my videos, um, so, and it also works in tab really well. So you can see that all of this is just one text box, and then what I did was I got a size that was small enough to work with what I wanted, and then I just, you know, went over with space and got these notes. Um, so, like, let's say he just played the open string again here on this second chord. Then I would just go over and I'd type a zero. And since I have monosyllabic font, it means that everything will line up as well. And, like, let's say he, like, did some really weird hammer-on stuff and kept going up two frets. Like, I could just write that in there, too. So that, to me, is so much easier than trying to assign text boxes to, like, each individual note. It's just way, way, way better. Um, the other thing that is terrible about individual text boxes is that in engrave mode, um, things like to get funky. So let me show you what happens when you do multiple text boxes. And I think this will work on like the very first part because as I went along, I figured out that one text box per, per bar was the way to go, but I don't think I figured it out this early. So it's possible that these right here uh, might be individual text boxes. Yeah, okay, good. So I can move this around, right? Woo! So all you have to do to get the individual text box um, to line up on the bar is to line it up with the strings. But if you click and drag it around, what happens is, look, it reformats based on whatever the text box is doing. And then if I were to try and move this up to the top string, it would redo again, probably. Yeah, see? So like, it has some weird new formatting thing that it does. And then by the time I'm done trying to drag all this around, see, like, like that's almost it. But now this little 12 right here on the right is not where it's supposed to be. And chances are, I'm gonna drag it right down to the string where it should be and everything will jump again. See? So that is what, another reason why individual text boxes uh, are not the way to go. Um, so um, that's why if you do one text box, you can drag it 
to be in a place in the bar one time, and then if you type in new information in the tablature, it doesn't, like, jump around and get all crazy like it does when you uh, drag multiple text boxes in the same bar. Also, of course, since it's on a per-bar basis, um, the text box on the next bar doesn't boing around if you drag around uh, the one in the first bar. So, there's also that. So I'm going to undo all of that so that it looks good again. Maybe I should have used a fresh document, but that's okay. Oh, hurry up. Okay. Boing, boing, boing. Oh, God. Please go back to where you were. Oh, no! This is not great. You know what? I haven't saved, so I'm just going to close it and not save it. And then, that'll be fine. So, yeah. That's how I was doing microtonal tab in Dorico and figuring out the rhythm. So I think that's actually the whole process, just how I transcribed the whole thing and how I did the microtonal tab and how I got it to look uh, fairly good. I used uh, Sebastian's faking tab in Dorico video, um, but then instead of using his method of putting an individual text box on each note for each individual tab to note, I used um, one text box per bar to sort of avoid the issues that come with that. So yeah, um, of course this would be a good time to, I guess, ask Dorico if they would consider creating microtonal tab support if it doesn't exist already. I get the idea that it doesn't exist already based on the comments that I've heard, but it would be very cool if you could use uh, the tab feature to not only just have equal temper tab pop up and be able to navigate within it, just like Dorico's excellent equal temperament transposition tools, which I'm amazed work as well as they do. Um, I'm sure something like that could happen. Um, and I also wonder if there could be maybe a situation where you could go between options of fretting. Like, if you had an equal temperament and you had that fretted, maybe if you didn't want to do that, you could use, like, either... Uh, well, not sense, but kind of almost the same thing where you could have, like, decimals of 12 EDO pitch classes. Like, let's say you had, like, a 250 cent fret from the open note. You could put, like, 1.5 as the fret number. Uh, something like that. Those sorts of options would be really cool. And I don't know if this is possible either, but it doesn't look like Sebastian's video here is even geared toward microtonality in general. So it might also be good to create a tool where you can have a tab as its own staff and everything instead of being forced to create a real tab through, like, getting notation for something and then seeing what that's like in tab, like having, like, tab all its own, um, I think that would be cool. Maybe that already exists already, I don't know. I'm not very smart at these software things, but these are just, uh, just spitballing my thoughts here. So yeah, um, thanks for watching this video, I'll be sure to keep you posted on anything. I've got, uh, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, and Patreon account. Uh, the Patreon account is for my podcast, uh, Now and Zen. Uh, and if you were to subscribe and like and share this video, especially with people who are interested in music transposition, notation, and other various uh, nerdy cool music stuff, I'd really appreciate it. So uh, thanks everyone for watching. Peace.